Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. The Bible tells us that long ago, the world was destroyed by a global flood because the people had become so wicked at that time. And of course, we have the geological evidence of the sedimentary layers all over the world that demonstrate clearly that the surface of the earth was at one time destroyed by water. And we have, of course, the the fossil record of that event. But nonetheless, as the after the flood, we find that it wasn't long again before people began rebelling against uh, God, the, the simple basic laws that God had set up for, for humans uh, to be happy, that we understand the Ten Commandments. Um, and it's interesting, in those Ten Commandments, you know, the, the first one is to have no other gods. Uh, before God, and then the next one is to not make a graven image and bow down to it. And so it seems that it wasn't long before people um, got back into making images and worshipping images in replace of the God that I guess they couldn't see. They couldn't see God, and we connect with God through through faith, through belief, through our mind, and. I guess for for many people, uh, took advantage of. They want something that they could look at, could touch, and and then they developed all sorts of scenarios about these idols. And when we look at the ancient civilizations, uh, whether they be in Egypt or uh, Babylon, uh, parts of Europe, Greece, India, China, the Americas, they have these. Uh, when we go right back in history, have these gods and idols that were parts of their, that, you know, were, that they believed in, that they, they worshipped. And there were different forms sometimes. So there were different, as we know, and the different uh, religions involved in worshipping ancestors and so forth. And it seemed that God had to reveal himself again. And we know through Abraham, who believed in God, who believed in the supernatural God you could pray to, the creator God, the God that created everything. There was a, a, the Bible records a real struggle to preserve that faith, that knowledge of the creator God down through uh, history. And as I've thought about this recently, I I was thinking in terms of the, the Big Bang Theory that so many people talk about Today, we, we um, every now and again there's an article on the news about you know scientists providing some new evidence for the Big Bang theory, and you know people in casual conversation we were talking about how we came to be. Uh, most my understanding is most non-Christians so think in terms of, well it was a Big Bang, and everything formed that there is, and we. In a way, it it's sort of become like another idol because the the Big Bang simply says that it's a way of forming matter, and uh, there in the beginning there you know there wasn't matter there was just something and it exploded and it became matter <laughs> and formed all the different stars and planets and and so forth. That is opposed to the biblical picture where, you know, God um, created uh, everything. And it's interesting, when I read in the, in the Bible there, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, um, the Bible reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the, sea and the birds of the air and the cattle and so forth over all the earth. But it's interesting here that God is saying it made the the earth and uh, formed it and the stars and the moon and so forth. And he says, and um, he'd made all the plants and animals, and birds, fish and so forth. And then he says, let us make man in our image. And if we go over to chapter Genesis chapter 2, there's a little bit more detail. And it talks about, then the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being. 
Now, this is um, interesting here because it, it talks about man being made uh, from the, the dust of the ground, in other words, the, the matter from the ground. And we, we know that. We know that uh, when we look at our... Our, you know, our body, we're, we're made up of uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, you know, the large part of uh, us are, are made up of those elements. And when you think about carbon as black, oxygen as a gas, hydrogen as a gas, and then, of course, there's all the, the trace elements like uh, uh, silica and magnesium and calcium, and, of course, magnesium and calcium and a little bit of iron. These are all metals and there's trace copper and, you know, there's all these uh, trace elements that make up part of us as well uh, that are there in, in small amounts. But And all these, when we look at these elements, they're, they're nothing like us, like, you know, potassium and sodium and calcium, magnesium, these important minerals in our diet, um, they're all metals. And then we have some of the non-metals like sulphur. Well, sulphur is, uh, can be yellow and it, it burns. You know, phosphorus, um, again, in, in certain forms can just spontaneously, um, you know, catch fire and burn in, in air. Uh, as I said, carbon can be black, carbon like in carbon soot, or it can be diamond. And so these atoms can take, you know, different forms that we call allotropes, but... It's interesting, God said he made us from these elements. So he made us out of the, the dust of the ground. And we can imagine that, okay, that we're just something like matter. We're just matter. But then God breathed into us and we became a living soul. And to me, this is a special part. So part of God, God breathed in. So so what is this this breath of God? And I think this... This breath of God is this supernatural connection. It's this non-material part of us that becomes our mind and our thoughts. But when we think about the Big Bang, the Big Bang doesn't explain that. And even further, when we look at this matter that we're made out of, it's it's quite uh, you know fascinating, and I, I read a an article uh, just the other day. It was a creation um, journal, and it said real particle physics disappoint big bangers. It starts off by saying all matter in the universe seems to be built up of seventeen named fundamental particles that interact by four fundamental forces. And the particles and all forces apart from gravity have been described in what they call a standard model. And the article goes on to um, say that, uh, that there's the discovery of different, you know, particles like the Higgs boson in um, in 2000, um, uh, 2012, 2012. But um, one of the still... Uh, things that is coming out though that they're finding as they do more and more uh, amount of research is that again the big bang should predict equal amounts of matter and antimatter and they find that hang on when we look out into the universe we find mainly matter we don't find very much antimatter so one of the things that they did was physicists um, from uh, 20 different physics research institutions in the world. And there was over uh, 100 physicists working on this project and they were trying to find some fault or error in, this, in the standard model that predicts that if you convert energy into matter, then you produce equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Because, as I said, when we look out in the universe, it's mainly matter. It's not antimatter. And so one of the things that they did involved um, measurements of the, of the weak force. And what they did to... This is one of the fundamental forces that are in uh, the nucleus of an atom. Uh, and this is um, the, the weak... For what we call weak force is a force that's responsible for the fusion reactions and fusion reactions are where energy is converted into into matter. 
And so what these scientists did was they shot very high energy electrons at protons. So protons are the positive nuclear charge particles in an atom, and they're actually made up of subparticles themselves, protons. An electron is a fundamental particle, though. And what they did was, as I said, they fired these very high energy electrons at the protons. And what they did was they measured the change in um, uh, electron spins that um, were resulted from this. And what they found was that the uh, results that the protons weak charge was a was a particular value of um, yeah point oh seven one nine actually, and but the value doesn't really matter. But the important point was that this value that they found for the value of the weak charge was in very fine agreement with what the actual standard model predicted. So they did this experiment. I know it's a bit complicated to, to understand. But essentially they were trying to see if there was some discrepancy in the standard physics model, but they couldn't find it. In other words, they still don't have an explanation for how the Big Bang could produce mainly matter and not antimatter. And... This made me think when we look at these elementary particles, when you know I was learning science in high school, we learnt that in the nucleus you had protons and neutrons and then there were electrons orbiting around. But of course now we know that those uh, particles in the nucleus of an atom, the neutrons and protons, are actually made up of more fundamental particles. And so what we need now by a fundamental a uh, particle is one that can't be broken down into subparticles. So in particle physics, an elementary particle or a fundamental particle is a subatomic particle with no substructure. So it's, it's not composed of other particles. And those particles currently thought to be the elementary particles are uh, uh, fermions, and so in the fermion group, we have quarks, leptons, antiquarks, and antileptons. And these are general matter particles. Now, a, uh, a fermion is a particle that obeys what is called fermion uh, Dirac statistics. Now, there are also other fundamental uh, particles or which are called bosons, um, and these are like the Higgs boson. And these are generally force-type particles that mediate or help control the interactions among the fermions. Um, and uh, so these bos um, bosons, these are sort of particles that obey what are called Bose-Einstein statistics. So when we look at matter now, it's much more complicated than we, we thought. Um, a, again, ordinary matter, as we think of it, is composed of atoms. And the subatomic constituents of the atom were first identified in the early 1930s as the electron and the pro uh, proton, um, along with uh, a photon, which is a... A par considered now a particle of electromagnetic radiation. And so, again, this whole structure is um, getting uh, more, more, more complex um, in terms of understanding uh, what is happening. And, of course, we have the, the different uh, forces as well. There's the weak force, which is... Uh, a sort of a electromagnetic type force between particles and photons. And then there's electromagnetism itself. And, of course, electromagnetism is... Uh, or electromagnetic type forces. In, in actual fact, they're responsible for things like friction, 
when we're rubbing one surface against another, when you think, we, we think of it as in friction, well, it's just the rough, but what is it that is pulling one surface against the, the, atom and, uh, the other? And, of course, it's the atoms that make up the molecules of that structure, whether it's wood or steel or... Uh, whatever it is, of course, aluminium is a pure element, but most things are made up of uh, molecules. But those molecules exert um, electromagnetism-type uh, forces. And we have another force which uh, is called the strong force or strong nuclear force, and this only operates inside the atomic nucleus because outside of the nucleus it becomes so weak that it becomes um, undetectable. So we've got this weak force which again is between is a force between particles and photons. Those are, this is the little particles of light uh, of, or of radiation. Uh, and then, as I said, we've got the main electromagnetism, and that's what we observe in friction and lighting and, um, you know, operates electric motors and, and so forth and magnets. And this force, electromagnetism, is much stronger then than the other, the fourth force, which is gravity. But the interesting fact about gravity is that gravity can't be shielded or transformed and the other thing is that gravity always attracts it never repels where sometimes electromagnetism can repel sometimes it can attract so these are the four fundamental forces that hold these basic particles together and then hold together the larger structures that make up the material things that um, we have. For example, we don't um, fall, um, we might be pulled down a mountainside by gravity, but we're slowed down by friction. So all these forces balance out against one another. And again, in the, in the structure of an atom, again, these forces are all balanced out so that we have stable structures in a lot of the atoms, but some atoms have unstable structures and therefore they break down. And that's uh, where we talk about radioactive uh, materials. Um, these are atoms where they're not stable and they're breaking down into a more stable form. Now, one of the things, of course, that the people who believe in the Big Bang Theory is that all these amazing structures, these four different types of forces, force fields, with their different properties, all had to somehow arise from somewhere. Where did they come from? Where did these forces come from? And the other thing that we have to understand is that these forces or energy fields are constrained by certain value, values. Now, why aren't these values changing? Why isn't the gravitational constant changing? Um, if other things are evolving, why aren't they changing if they formed? And if they formed, where did they come from? And why did they stop at those particular values if, they, if there was some sort of adjustment mechanism? And so understanding force field theory is, is you know, one of the major challenges of, of science today and understanding these fields, let alone these, these particles and these subatomic particles that, that we're trying to understand, these elementary particles that can't be broken down into anything more that constitutes matter and is extremely dense. And as I've mentioned in other programs too, when we think in terms of the atom, the atom has a nucleus where the material matter is concentrated and its mass is concentrated in that nucleus. And then out from the nucleus are orbiting electrons that are carrying with them their electric fields. And the bonding between atoms essentially takes place as an interaction between these overlapping orbitals of these electric fields. In other words, these overlapping electromagnetic fields 
hold the atoms in place that can make intensely strong and hard structures like steel and diamond and these things. But when we look at the actual amount of matter there, I think the uh, analogy is roughly that if the nucleus was the size of a golf ball, then the outer part of the atom would be about three kilometres away, um, or, you know, two and a bit miles away, uh, or three or four kilometres, you know, two miles away. So there's all this empty space. So we're largely empty space that is filled by, by force fields. But again, everything is just balanced. And as James Clark Maxwell pointed out at the time when Darwin's theory was evolving and people were raving on about you know evolution and how evolution explained the origin of man, Maxwell, who developed Maxwell's equations that were the first mathematical um, representations of these force fields, um, Maxwell laid the foundation and, as I said, the... Uh, the um, light was an electromagnetic fields and so forth. Uh, he pointed out, how did matter evolve? How did atoms evolve? And these are, these are really major problems. And people are jumping in and believing the Big Bang. The Big Bang explains everything. But the Big Bang doesn't there's no big bang model that actually fits the laws of physics as we know them that can explain the origin of matter and the formation of stars and so forth in our universe it just doesn't work and secondly then how did the structure of these particles form and how is it that they then all fit together and interact together so that they can form a stable nucleus how can they produce these amazing fields? What's the concept of gravity? Why can't we shield gravity? How can gravity affect light? Gravity is gravity, and yet it can affect electromagnetic radiation, which theoretically has no matter in it. Um, these are all the fascinating things, but it's all fine-tuned so that it works. And so as all these atoms formed of all the different elements, all these different elements are just the right types of atoms to form the right sorts of bonding, like with carbon. Carbon has this four outer shell electrons that enables four bonds to form, which enables these amazing network cross-link structures to form that give stability to things. On the other hand, we have metals have structures where they have electrons on the outside that are highly movable, that enable then these close atoms to bond all together, but metals will flow. I have some, some brackets in my wardrobe and just under the weight of the clothes, the metal has slowly transformed in shape. It has actually just slowly stretched. And so, again, we find this in liquids um, and the amazing property of supercooled liquids and glasses, all these different amazing structures that enable life to exist, us, our bodies to exist and work, all just right. So how did they... It's as if they've designed. They're amazing systems that design. They're not higgledy-piggledy. If something evolved, we would expect it to be higgledy-piggledy, but they're not. Everything is in this order. When we think of all the different elements, they're all one proton different. And just changing that proton, the number of protons in the nucleus, totally changes the properties of these elements but in a pattern so that we have all the non-metals have a particular structure, the metals have another particular structure that relates to their physical properties and characteristics. It's, it, it fits plan, it fits design. So there's no real explanation for these laws that we, or this behaviour that we see in the universe that fits logical, mathematical formulae. 
and these energy fields that are amazing, the electromagnetic fields, the weak force, the strong force and gravity, these these fields with their, their properties. And, and like I said, how do you detect gravity? You detect gravity because it, it pulls you. But what, what pulls you? For me, believing that there is something outside this material world that is responsible for this material world makes far more sense than believing this material world is all there is because there had to be something designing and governing and constraining and putting together all these forces and these fundamental particles to make everything that exists. So to me, believing the Bible account that there is a supernatural God outside this material world makes far more sense and that that is the God that created everything and it's non that God is non-material just like our thoughts are non-material but our thoughts are creative our thoughts can understand mathematics our thoughts can understand and unpick this this universe structure we can't create the the new one we can't design and um, you know put DNA codes together that make new creatures that work but we can understand, we're learning to understand um, by working together, th- teams of hundreds of thousands of scientists all working together and comparing notes are beginning to understand little bits about how life works and, and so forth. To me, it then makes more sense that there's this super mind outside and that's what the Bible talks about. And it talks about that Man became so depraved, so primitive, so, I guess, his mind just so distraught and dumbed down that God had to come as a human, as Jesus Christ, and teach us again about himself. But he paid the ultimate price of dying for all the wicked things that we have done. He paid the price so God can forgive us now and we can be saved and spend eternity with this amazing God that loves us and created the universe. That's why I think the Bible just makes so much sense and I would encourage everyone listening, read, get a Bible and read it and reread it and get to know the wonderful God that made the universe. We didn't get here via the Big Bang, we got here via God. And remember, if you'd like to listen to this and other programs in this series, just Google 3ABN Australia, or one word, .org.au, and click on the Listen button. You've been listening to Faith and Science. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.